You're listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma, and I'm your host, Trish Close. Today's episode is sponsored by The Culinarium, Gourmet Provisions, and Fine Kitchenware. Andrea Sloniker on the podcast today. She's written more than a handful of cookbooks, including the one right behind me, Wine Food, New Adventures in Drinking and Cooking. She wrote this with friend Dana Frank. In fact, you'll see that a lot in her cookbooks. She loves to collaborate with other chefs and writers. From Nebraska, Andrea says she actually double majored in psychology and advertising, but she could not shake this love of cooking. So she moved to Portland. She had several jobs in the culinary world, but it wasn't until a trip to Europe where the light bulb went off for her. And she said cookbook writing and recipe development was really what she wanted to do. So back to Portland and she hit the ground running. She has done all things culinary, cookbook writing, culinary consultant, food stylist, which is what she's doing currently. She's also a teacher at the Art Institute of Portland. She collaborates with other writers and chefs on culinary content, other projects, cookbooks, you name it, she's done it. She just wrapped up a project with a chef in Atlanta that comes out in uh, April. She'll tell you all about that. But really, she says in all the jobs that she's done and all of the projects, it all comes down to one thing, dreaming big and then dreaming bigger. Here's Andrea Slaughter. And you're joining us this morning from right up the freeway. I love it. Portland, Oregon. I know. I love it. Uh, Andrea Sloniker, thank you so much for being here. Author, um, recently Wine Food, which I have right behind me, New Adventures in Drinking and Cooking. But you wrote a total of six cookbooks, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, Just Those are just my books. I've also um, helped chefs and other cookbook authors with their projects. I was so going to say, about a dozen books, you, I think at this point. yeah, you've helped fellow writers and chefs with other projects as well. So there's six of mm-hmm. yours, but there's lots others out there that you've contributed yeah. to. So yes. Awesome. Um, true. Yeah. Um, also, uh, let's see, where did I have this? The Picnic, which is a, a cookbook of yours, won a 2016 International Association of Culinary Professionals Wait, yes, Professionals Award for Best General Cookbook. Um, but you're also a contributor to Food and Wine. You're a food stylist. You're a culinary consultant. Whew, that's exhausting. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Cooking teacher. You did, I don't know if you mentioned that yet. Uh, I have it on here. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, you were um, yes. a teacher at the Art Institute of Portland. I was, yes. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Yeah. Among other places. But yes, it's, it's kind of a... Um, full spectrum of the food world, food media world, and, you know, teaching people to cook in different ways through writing and in class, For you sure. know, in classes and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. When I was doing, um, I don't do a ton of research on my guests because I really like to discover things as I'm discovering things in the conversation, but researching you, that's one thing I noticed is that every aspect of your life right now, correct me if I'm wrong, really has to do with food. It's a lot of food stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Food and wine. My yeah. husband's a wine. Maker, so we do a lot with wine as well. Hence my last cookbook was about wine and food pairing. Um, but yeah, it is a life revolving around food, a career at least and a life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'm in it because I love to eat and I love to cook. So well, it's always fun sure. when the things that you love, um, end up, uh, being your paycheck too. So true. right. It's true. Um, Blessing in a cup. Sometimes it's like, oh, I really like have to cook this thing. You know, sometimes it takes a little bit of the pleasure of cooking away if you like feel like you have to do a project and there's a deadline. But for the most part, yes, I feel very blessed that I'm able to do what I love every day. That's fun. It's funny you said that. I do reels occasionally, like cooking reels on Instagram. I'm not a food blogger. I'm not a chef, but it's just fun to cook and share things with people. Um, especially when you get feedback from, you know, people who follow you or don't follow you, but there's nights where I'm just like, I don't want to make bolognese tonight on camera. I don't want to do it. A lot of it is like my cravings don't line up with what I'm supposed to cook that night (laughs) or like the season doesn't match up because a lot of times I'm making, you know, Christmas cookies in August, for instance, Mm -hmm. for, uh, either a marketing project that I'm doing food styling for or recipe development for a magazine where the lead time is really far out. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of like, maybe not always cooking exactly what you want to cook, but at least you're cooking. (laughs) At least you're in the kitchen doing something fun with your hands. Exactly. I don't know if you saw my plant just move my cats in here. Yeah. I was wondering, was there a little, 
you'll see like her little submarine yeah she'll like a submarine tail that'll uh, float by in a hot second um (laughs) andrea let's back up just a little bit where are you from originally i'm from nebraska columbus nebraska okay yeah what was that like um well columbus was a small town there was about twenty thousand people and um you know midwestern town lots of manufacturing and farming and um very different from you know, the life I have now in Portland, but, um, I, I always dreamed of living on the coast and getting out of my little Midwestern life. And so I've kind of left and never looked back really. Yeah. I appreciate it now though, when I go visit my family there, I, I find the, um, the beauty in the, um, vast cornfields and the big sunsets, but, um, for the most part, I'm happy to be traveling a lot and in Portland a lot. And awesome. Um, was food important growing up in your family? Um, it was my whole family, um, loves eating. <laughs> um, we all love just food and good food. And my mom cooked, you know, most meals that we had, we got, went out every Friday night, we had family night where we got to go out and have Chinese food or pizza or whatever. But, um, for the most part, my mom made dinner almost every night and it was, a lot of, you know, I grew up in the eighties, so it was a lot of, um, semi homemade cooking, I guess you could say lots of Campbell soup casseroles and things like that. But, um, it was always delicious though. She had a really good, um, you know, she was good around the kitchen. My grandmother actually was an amazing baker and, um, she made pies and cakes and things like that. And I loved cooking with her. I didn't cook as much with my mom. She was kind of, she had three kids and she was always in a hurry to get dinner on the table. So she didn't have the patience to cook with me. So I think I kind of, um, I almost feel like I wanted to cook more because I couldn't. And so when I was in high school, I used to love cooking. My, my girlfriends all have memories of, um, these big elaborate brunches. I used to cook if they'd spend the night on the weekends and I'd cook like omelets and hash browns, you know, like frozen hash browns, but I'd, um, you know, add something special to it and toast things. So yeah, cooking when I was a kid wasn't, um, I don't know, it wasn't as, I, I didn't kind of learn to cook with my mom, but I evolved into wanting to cook more, especially when I went to college, I guess you could say. Yeah, I feel like, I don't remember like actually growing up being in the kitchen cooking with my mom. My mom was a great cook, uh, so was my grandmother. But I think when you're surrounded by good cooks, and I'm from South Carolina, so we had a lot in our family, bakers and cooks. Even if you're not mm-hmm. doing the things, I feel like you absorb some of it, right? Yeah, exactly. I totally absorb the appreciation for having a good home cooked meal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, my mom used to make this thing called delicious chicken, and it was like roasted chicken that she would shred up with canned mushrooms. Do you remember canned yep. mushrooms? Canned mushrooms, always. Yeah, we had canned mushrooms in so many things. Yep. And then cream of mushroom soup, and there was like cheddar cheese on top of it. And I mean, it's called delicious chicken for a reason because it's delicious. That sounds like something my mom would have made. Yeah. And I, I actually still have a little guilty pleasure soft spot in my heart for that kind of food because yeah. it's what I. Yeah, it's what you kind of grow up with. Right. Um. So after high school plans, what were you looking to be? Go do. Um, after high school, I went to school at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska, okay. and I started out, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I started out as a double major in advertising and psychology because that was what I was most interested in in high school. I was fascinated with the mind and right. it sounded fun to do advertising. Um, and I very quickly realized that I was obsessed with cooking <laughs> and that's all I wanted to do. I, I would be cooking, you know, I had friends that had apartments and I would go over and make elaborate meals for them. And, um, you know, when I was 19 years old, freshman in college and then that was around the time that the Food Network was becoming popular mm-hmm. and there was really good um, deep dive cultural shows on Food Network still, I think, um, about you know, like melting pot of cuisine and, um, you know, really interesting Italian food and things like that. And I was kind of fascinated by that. And I watched Food Network all the time yeah. <laughs> and I would make the recipes that I saw on, on the shows. And I just really became completely enthralled with cooking and food and food culture really. And like the history of food and different cuisines around the world and things like that. That's so funny. So I, you I, say that that's so funny. Cause I was the same way, just absolutely obsessed yeah. with food network. Yeah. 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 Um, and then 
I decided to switch my major to, well, actually I did all this research, you know, it was like the early days of the internet and I was like on the internet and in the, in the library or whatever, um, Googling like things about being a chef or I don't know if Google is a thing, actually, somehow there was a search engine. Yeah. Something. <laughs> I was looking for, I, you know, and I looked into culinary school and I re- did all this research on the culinary Institute of America. And I, presented this idea with my, to my parents. I wanted to quit college and go to culinary school in New York, upper, you know, upstate New York. And they were just like, what? <laughs> I didn't, um, you know, coming from a small town in Nebraska, mm-hmm. it just seemed like a very lofty goal and idea. And they didn't, you know, there weren't even chefs in my town. That wasn't even a thing. So it was, it seemed a little um, crazy to them, I think. And they convinced me to stay in my university and get a four-year, you know, bachelor's degree. So I switched my major to um, restaurant and food service administration. <laughs> so I got a degree in that. Okay. And but that allowed me opportunity to learn about food. It was a lot of, it was in the um, nutrition and like food science department of my college. So it was a lot of food science and, um, you know, cooking and researching food in general. So it was great. There was the business side and then there was the, you know, more artsy side of it. So I actually think I got a lot out of it and, um, you know, don't really have regrets about doing that. I do wish I would have gone to Culinary Institute of America sometimes, but um, I can't say I regret my career path. (laughs) You know, it's led to good things. So no, I, yeah, for sure. I mean, you look back and my mom said the same thing to me. I wanted to go to on Broadway <laughs> and she was like, let's stick to journalism. I mean, let's just stick to that for yeah. a while and just see where that leads you. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the talk I had. And yeah. they were like, you can go to culinary school after, which I did end up going to culinary school years later, but another story. <laughs> right. Well, and I'm sure, like you said, I mean, it did, your degree did play a role, plays a role. I mean, in Mm -hmm. in what you're doing now, right? I mean, it was the foundation. Sure, yeah, it was a great foundation. I did a lot of projects where I was able to kind of mold the the concept of the project into what I was really interested in. And so I I have really good memories of just getting this great foundation of being able to research food and learn about food on my own, you know, through my own resources or whatever. So yeah, it definitely, um, and I made great friends and I got opportunities to go to travel. I was like the su- student representative for my school at the um, National Restaurant Association trade show in New York City and where I met some like amazing chefs like Rick Bayless and all these, um, like I think Mara Batali was there or something. I don't know. Um, and so it, it did give me some great opportunities early on, you know, when I was in my late teens, early 20s to to be in the food world, I guess. So what came after college then? Um, I moved to Portland kind of on a whim with a girlfriend who also wanted to get out of Nebraska and move somewhere interesting. And it was kind of a, not a really fully thought out plan. We just were like, let's move to Portland. It sounds so cool. It was a very burgeoning food scene at the time in Portland. Um, Kind of the, the, you know, the beginning days of it being um, kind of like the media darling and, people just talking about what was going on and um, chefs moving here from all over the country because of the access to amazing ingredients and the, um, I guess, low bar for entry in the, you know, opening your own restaurant, the really affordable. And, you know, it wasn't the city that it is now. It was um, kind of the infancy of being a great food city. And that was really interesting to me, of course. And I, just moved out here and started working in restaurants and catering. I had like multiple jobs. I was actually interviewed and on the cover of the weekly magazine newspaper here um, for having, I had like six jobs at once, all in food, trying to figure out what's my path, where do I want to go? Having worked in restaurants for all through college and into my early twenties, I knew I wanted to pursue something else with food and not necessarily restaurants, but what else was there? You know, what, what was, what were the other opportunities that to discover, I guess. When, what year was it when you moved to Portland? 2004. Oh, okay. Cause I know Portland now. I don't, I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't, I I didn't even know. um, I don't think I ever even went to Portland around that time in the early two thousands. So I guess paint a picture for me. What was it like? Um, it was like, it was, uh, gosh, what was it like? It's so different now. Um, it was like a small city. I yeah. came thinking that it was like I was moving to this big city and it wasn't. It was a small city still. Mm-hmm. And um 
it was interesting. There was definitely like an alternative culture and there still is here. It's, it's kind of different now, but it's, it's definitely an alternative kind of the keep Portland weird was definitely the tagline here for yeah. in those days. Um, but there was this energy around the food world, lots of young chefs that had cool ideas and were just opening these like little sort of like underdeveloped restaurants, I guess you could say, where, you know, they would just like rent a little old storefront and turn it into a restaurant that was, didn't have a lot of money behind it, but it had so much soul. And that was really interesting and appealing to me and fascinating and, you know, inspiring. And um, yeah, there was, there was a lot of energy in the food here and hope and um, enthusiasm and, you know, creativity, which was like, super exciting. I think the first time I visited Portland, because I moved to Oregon in 2002. So the first time I visited Portland was maybe around, I don't know, like 2009, 2010. And I remember asking someone in our hotel, it's like, hey, where, where's an awesome place to go, you know, grab like some incredible food that's not crazy expensive. And he goes, you literally just, that's every place in, in the city. So there was like this renaissance around like, 2007 2008 where it was just like an explosion of restaurants opening and you know like that foundational layer was um in you know like the early 2000s and then by like 2007 I would say it became like this bubble like this huge thing and so many people moved here so many chefs moved here from all over the country to open restaurants and you know saw opportunity and um ability to follow their dream in a way you couldn't in New York City or LA or other places that um were just not very, you know, it was just like lots of things um, holding you back financially or, you know, ingredient wise, like there's just, it's like such a beautiful um, farm country here and wine. And, you know, there's every ingredient you could want is here basically. Um, So it was, it was a big thing in like time right before you visited where it was just like, especially by that time, 2009, 2010, it was like, I feel like that was the heyday of the Portland food scene. Interesting. I think also moving here, you know, I wasn't into wine or food when I moved here. I was in news. And so it was like crime stories and all these things. But little by little, I started to get really interested in the wine and food scene in Southern Oregon, Mm -hmm. at least. And then it started to occur to me how, first of all, how sustainable the state is, right? If you look at all the things mm-hmm. that we offer, grow, produce, manufacture here in the state. And I don't think people outside understand. And I'm really, I'm not trying to like hair flip Oregon, but like there's so much good stuff here if you're into food and wine. I mean, mushrooms, like, you know, fish, yeah. uh, wine, like there's cheese. There's all these crazy good things that exist just in the state. Yeah. And artisan makers, like yeah. you mentioned cheese bread, cheese, all the, like, it's like the top quality of everything. It like, is. There's just so much, um, you know, people just strive for the best in all of those um, kind of little niche food businesses. And it's just really amazing. So I can imagine when you move here as a food nut, <laughs> you know, like you, you like, it was a Disneyland for you. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, well, when I moved here, it was kind of the beginning days, but then it was like, so yeah. exciting kind of growing up with it in those next like five years or so um just seeing it evolving and developing and how it inspired me in my own career and you know thinking bigger and about the possibilities of what I could do with my own career in food so yeah yeah, it was exciting so you have all these jobs (laughs) you're this you're this just I which I think is brilliant right it's like it's like grad school it's like an internship like you're just trying to figure out it was like yeah. It wasn't education. It was like um, every day I had a different thing. So I was like, Mondays I worked at Ken's Artisan Bakery, which is still one of the best bakeries in Portland. Um, and then Tuesdays I worked like in the mornings with this PR maven who represented a lot of the hot restaurants in town. And then um, in the afternoons, I worked at a little local magazine called Northwest Palette. It's no longer around, but it was around for like 30 years mm-hmm. um, that covered food and wine in Oregon. And the region, it's, um, like Washington, Oregon, Idaho, I think Vancouver, BC. Um, and then I, what was my other job? And then I worked, um, a few nights a week at a French bistro called Carafe with this fabulous chef who's, who's a dear friend of mine, Pascal Satan. 
And he was definitely a mentor of mine. And then I started working a couple of days a week with, or, you know, like afternoons a week with a really prolific cookbook author who was in Portland named Diane Morgan. And she kind of became my um, mentor. And I, I think of it as kind of an apprenticeship. I worked with her for three years on her cookbook projects. Um, and the last one culminating in me like co-authoring a book with her. So it was, yeah, it was a great time to explore all the options and see what, you know, what lands and what, what um, really got me going. Sure. And, and, you know, well, I was going to ask what got you going, what job were you just like always so excited to go to? Um, the one that I was most excited about was the recipe development and the cookbook writing for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I kind of knew the job was a stepping stone. It was just like a, you know, a way to make a little money and learn about great bread and be in the mix with people. But um, I was interested in the PR thing at first, but I definitely, I quickly knew that wasn't really for me, but it was still kind of fun because it was like learning about the media. I learned about media, you know, on the other side of the coin where, um, you know, you also generating story ideas and whatnot, but um, then the, the magazine job was also very interesting. So it's like, I feel like I learned so much from all of those jobs and they kind of all came together and, you know, now I still do a million things. <laughs> so it hasn't really changed much. I I'm just kind of like, I was just going to say that. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say that all of those jobs, I feel like you're still doing all of them. They're just, they've evolved <laughs> into different things. Yeah. What do you yeah. think it, what do you think it was about or is about recipe development? That's so fascinating. Um, I love the creativity. My favorite thing is sitting down to do a project, you know, a project is pre presented to me and just doing the brainstorming part of it. I love thinking about food. I love the creativity that goes into it and pulling from um, different, I do, I travel a lot. I pull from my travels a lot and I feel like everything, you know, when I'm out in the world eating at restaurants or um, visiting different cities or countries, I'm constantly, you know, my wheels are constantly spinning and I'm, um, just constantly inspired. And I love that. And I love coming home and having this um, new found inspiration to do something. So uh, you moved to Portland, you said 2004, and you've never left. No, I did a very short, like four month stint in Northern California. Um, I had a boyfriend there <laughs> and then moved back. Really quickly. Always. Always. But, um, other than that, I lived in Portland the whole time. Yes. Oh, I, and I did go to Europe. I was actually, I was gone for about a year. I went to um, in what, 2006, 2007, I went and traveled around. That was kind of my, really my turning point in my life where I had done this restaurant business. I'd worked in restaurants and catering companies. And I was like, okay, what's next for me? And I went and traveled around Europe. I quit my job, you know, I'd saved up some money and like backpacked around Europe for six months. And, um, that was really when I decided, like, I don't want to do restaurants and catering. I want to do food writing and media and get into other things. And so that kind of was like my biggest inspirational moment, I think, in, in my career, because I just was um, so enthralled with all of Europe. I went to many countries in Western Europe and just was learning about the food and writing, you know, journaling and writing about what I was learning and seeing and tasting. And, um, I just really was drawn to that. So I think that that kind of led to yeah. me more drawn to the recipe writing and the food writing. The light bulb went off. Yeah. Light, big light bulb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. I love it when that happens. Um, okay. Yeah. So you go back to Portland and then what is it like you dive in to this career? Yeah. I mean, all these jobs and I'm, I'm really, um, actually it was my chef friend, Pascal, who had the French bistro and he was like really, um, um, inspiring to me and a huge, a great mentor to me. And he was the one that's like, go for it. You can write cookbooks. Like there's this woman, he introduced me to Diane Morgan, who was the cookbook author in town. And he's like, I know you can do this and you just have to apply yourself. And I, to me at that time, the idea of writing a cookbook seemed as realistic as being a rock star. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Little old me, how, who wants to hear anything from me? Who wants to like, you know, it just didn't seem like something realistic that I could ever achieve. And so having that, you know, person that I'd worked with, you know, in the kitchen and he's like this great, 
French chef tell me that I could do it. It was huge inspiration. And um, yeah, just kind of propelled me into believing in myself too. Well, and I think, I think very, very similar, um, you know, even doing a podcast and interview, it's like, why would anyone want to listen to these interviews, right? Like, what do I have to offer that other people yeah. would actually want to hit play and listen for 45 minutes? Like, it just blows my mind. But I think people do. And obviously, you, there was someone that believed in you that was like, actually, you do have a lot to offer and you should be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And I still, I think about that a lot and I now have assistants who work with me, um, on my food styling projects and recipe, um, testing and development and stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm, I think about that a lot. Mm -hmm. There's one in particular that has really, it was this man who was working with me, young man, and he has really taken off with, um, food journalism. And I am just so proud of him. I feel like I see so much of myself in him and, his dreams and goals and like, just believe, you know, I, I just really am encouraging him to follow that too, because I, I know how important that is to have someone who's kind of in the world and doing it, um, see something in you and believe in you and push you towards it. So, um, assistance that to me is a level of success. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's necessary. But sometimes when I do these photo shoots, um, you know, like, a million things in one day. It's, sure. it's necessary to have lots of assistance. Uh, so, I believe yeah. it. I want a producer. I'm going to put that out in the universe, manifest a producer for myself. That's what I want in life. Um, so cook, what was your first cookbook that you put out? It's called pretzel making at home. Okay. I was going to ask you, I have pretzels down on, on my piece yeah. of paper right here, because when doing your research, pretzels were coming up everywhere for you. It's like, I know, isn't that funny how pretzels, like, pretzels, pretzels. Yeah. I'm still known as like the pretzel gal, but, um, yeah, that was 2012. Um, I think 2012, 2013, something like that. Um, that idea was born from my experience working, um, with Diane Morgan, um, on cookbooks and her publisher was Chronicle books. So I developed a kind of connection with them and met the editors and learned the process. And that was my, I guess, gateway into doing books on my own. So I, at that time, they were publishing a lot of books that were single subject baking books or desserts or, um, you know, donuts, whoopie pies, things like that, like very deep dive into one little topic. And simultaneously I was seeing like pretzel breads and pretzel buns and things like that kind of popping up on bakery, like little artisan bakery menus and things like that. And I just kind of had this idea. I was like, what about a book about pretzels? And I especially was drawn to it because my ancestors came over from um, German part of Switzerland and settled in um, the Pennsylvania Dutch country, which is where pretzels were first brought to America. And it's still like the pretzel capital of the world (laughs) or of of America, not of the world, but of America. And they consume like 12 times more pretzels than anyone else in the country. And that's where um, hard pretzels were invented. So anyway, I kind of had like this cultural background or interest in it too. And so that just seemed kind of like a great first book idea for me to pursue. And yeah, it was a very scientific kind of Mm -hmm. um, research process because there's a lot of science that goes into pretzels. Well, then Um, I also noticed you were in different uh, magazines and articles talking about pretzels because Mm -hmm. you had come out with this cookbook. And so there were just these like tips and tricks from Andrea Mm Sloniker who wrote this book on pretzels. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, I got into doing more, um, food journalism, food writing was through my books actually is being like an expert on pretzels at that point and people interviewing me about them and, you know, wanting roundups of the best pretzels in the country and things like that. So yeah, I became for a few years there, I was like the pretzel guru. Pretzel queen. I still think of myself that, but you know, it's less and less, but, um, that book's actually out of print at this point, unfortunately. So I don't know why Chronicle didn't want to continue to print that book. It's still, I think I still have the most people commenting like, Oh, where do I get this book? Or, you know, email, I get people emailing me all the time, asking me questions, like really specific questions about pretzel making and troubleshooting pretzels. And, um, a guy who wanted to open a pretzel shop that I consulted with, on, you know, like his recipes and things. So yeah, it's been 
it's definitely been a big part of my <laughs> my writing career is the pretzel thing. Well, and I did I did do a um, story for Food and Wine just last year actually about pretzels and kind of revisiting it. You know, it was like several years later, ten years later almost. So, yeah, it's yeah. hilarious to me what sticks with people and what doesn't, and the thing that you think everybody's going to glob onto and like this is going to be the thing that I'm known for. No, it's not. Yeah. 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 Uh, We're going to talk about the other cookbooks in just a second. But first, a message from today's sponsor. We'll be right back. Gourmet provisions and fine kitchenware, a cook's dream, all nestled in the culinarium in downtown Ashland, Oregon. Discover the latest in bakeware and cookware and timeless pieces to complete your kitchen collection. Unfold something new and fresh for your tabletop. Find all the essentials for your home bar. Stock your pantry with an array of gourmet goods, oils, salts, and specialty items. Shop the culinarium from the comfort of your own home. Visit ashlandculinarium.com and discover the finest gourmet provisions in kitchenware. The pretzel cookbook was your first one, and I wrote all of them down. Wine Food is the most recent cookbook. Okay. There's a cookbook on pears. Yeah. So that was a short stack edition. Okay. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but mm-hmm. they're, uh, it's like a series of these really sweet um, hand bound um, kind of vintage looking yeah. booklet. Well, I'd call it a booklet. It's really more of a booklet. It's a collection of like 25 recipes on a particular ingredient. And they, um, the short stack group, the people that behind it tapped writers and chefs, like cookbook authors, food writers, chefs around the country to do a really deep dive into one particular ingredient. And yeah, so I did one on pears because pears are mostly grown in Oregon. It's kind of like per capital of the US. And I have done a lot of work over the years with the um, USA Pears, the Pear Bureau, yeah. the like the marketing arm that represents all the pear growers. And most of them are in our region. So yeah, it was... Um, yeah, it was a fun little book to work on. That was my, I think, fourth or something. Okay. Um, before that, I did right after the pretzel book, I did a book about eggs called Eggs on Top. Eggs on Top. Yeah, Love it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That one was just kind of a fun little book. I love eggs. I love cooking eggs. I cook them like every day. And I wanted to do something about eggs, but there had been many books about eggs written at that time, though. That was like um, maybe like 20. 12, 2013, something like that. They started looking at book. There was kind of a trend with eggs in restaurants. I thought I was seeing eggs put on everything and kind of turning a brunch, a dish into a brunch dish, but just putting totally. an egg on it and just adding protein, adding flavor, adding a sauce. Like there were so many things that I thought an egg did to elevate a dish that I thought it would be kind of a fun book to do eggs on different things. And, you know, it's just kind of a cutesy little thing, but I like it. also the, the first part of the book is really um, detailed egg cookery. So different ways of cooking eggs and kind of coming at it in a real scientific kind of geeky way. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> there's, there's, it's a twofold book. There's a like egg, how to cook eggs. And then there's like what to put the eggs on. So <laughs> Um, I just interviewed uh, a while back, Lisa Steele. She has a blog, Fresh Eggs Daily. She's like the queen of the coop is what the media has has coined her as. Um, But we talked a lot about why eggs are so expensive right now and like the things to look for on a carton and why it's really important if you have access to local farms or friends or family with chickens, like get their eggs. Like that's the best way to do it. It is huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. Um, fascinating interview with Lisa Steele. Um, after eggs on top, well, then you also have a cookbook, The Picnic. Yeah. So then the Picnic and Beer Bites. I yeah. so I have two books that came out in the same year, twenty fourteen. Um, and those are both co-authored. I wrote them with friends, people who are were once friends or you know were friends before, and are I became really good friends with um, my co-author Christian De Benedetti on the Beer Bites book. We knew each other before, but then through the process, we kind of became very close and it was a great collaboration. And then the picnic I wrote with two really great girlfriends of mine that um, had co-founded with me and a group of girlfriends in Portland, uh, the Portland Picnic Society. So we had a picnic club. It was our way of, it was like our version of a book club because we're all food obsessed people. And um, it was our way of gathering monthly and 
around food and celebrating the short-lived summer, spring, beautiful weather time of year when you can Mm -hmm. actually be sitting outside eating (laughs) without an umbrella in Portland. So it was kind of a fun, um, that was just like a really fun thing we did. There was a lot of energy in our group around food in that time. And everyone in the group was doing really exciting, different things. We had a woman who owns Olympia Provisions, the salami company. We had a chocolatier who had this great um, chocolate shop called Alma. And the three of us were all that wrote the book. were all food writers in different ways. Marnie was more of a journalist. She's a really wonderful food journalist and journalists in general, not even just food. Um, and then Jen had this wonderful blog. Jen Stevenson had this great blog and she was just kind of a local um, food guru and um, wrote about local restaurants and, you know, had a really fun personality and um, kind of funny, humorous way of writing. So we all came together to write that book about our experiences picnicking with our girlfriends and, um you know, elaborated on it. You know, we, we definitely learned a lot more about picnicking through the process of writing the book. We discovered some, you know, tricks and tips and things like that. I feel like I've been in the city. I've been in the city when the sun comes out, (laughs) it's like the entire, all of Portland is outside. Yeah. Yeah. If there is sun, even in the winter, we were joking about last week, there was a lot of sunshine in it, but it was like the coldest day ever. It was like 25 degrees and, but it was sunny. We're like, there's going to be people in their shorts on their skateboards, (laughs) eating, you know, drinking beers on picnic benches somewhere um, because it is special when the sun comes out. Very special. Uh, Let's talk a little bit. What's that? (laughs) And we did have some winter picnics as well. There just you go. To, and we would, do, we would also do indoor picnicking at like one of our apartments at the time. We all had like apartments and we were, um, we'd spread picnic blankets in the living room and everyone would bring a dish and we'd just like, Perfect. you know, way of gathering in the winter and still making it a potluck and kind of fun and no low stress. Nobody had, you know, nobody had to have 12 chairs around their dining room table. So right. Was, right. Well, yeah. If it's 20 degrees in Southern Oregon, I will probably be at a winery. It does not matter. There are blankets. I mean, yep, yeah. Exactly. So I feel you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about wine food, new adventures in drinking and cooking. This one you wrote with uh, Dana Frank. Yeah. And she has a wine shop in Portland, right? Yeah. Wine bar, wine shop okay. called Bar Norman. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Super fun cookbook. And I love this because if you're not a wine person, but you always have that question of like, what should we, I'm going to have a dinner party. What should I serve with this? You guys like really break it down in this cookbook. Yeah. Yeah. This book is definitely my biggest passion project. It's definitely the most me book that I've done. I'd say, um, definitely, um, taps into the way I really cook and eat and think about food and, um, there's always wine involved. <laughs> yeah. So you're my kind of woman. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it was an amazing project. We, it was another ex- example of, I knew Dana through the food and wine industry in Portland. And in the course of writing the project or writing the book, we became best friends. Like she's still probably my best friend in Portland, I'd say. And, um, you know, we, we totally bonded over our shared interest in cooking and kind of our kinship with the way we like to cook and mm-hmm. the types of wines we like to drink and how we think about pairing wine, not just as, you know, like a uh, nerdy, like this flavor profile goes perfectly with this flavor profile. It was more about like what moments make sense for serving certain wines and food, mm-hmm. you know, like, thought about it. And that's kind of how the chapters are laid out is, um, thinking about like seasonality and time of day and the yeah. mood of the moment, you know, like there's a whole chapter on cozy night in it's the chapter title. And it's about, you know, the type of food you want to cook on a cold winter day when it's raining outside yeah. and it's like a casual evening in maybe the fireplace is on, you've got your sweatpants on and like what kind of food and wine do you want to eat in that moment? And then there's um, like a whole chapter on, like celebrations and like big dinner parties. And it's a little more like a little more elaborate cooking. Like what kind of stuff are you going to prepare if you're having a dinner party and, you know, putting on your nice clothes and your lipstick, you know? So, um, and then there's a chapter on salads and like pairing wine with salads Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, thinking about that, you know, like lighter eating and wine still makes sense. And that's kind of a hard thing for a lot of people is pairing wines with salads because of the vinaigrette kind of, um, yeah. can 
rival the wine flavors. So we really wanted to tackle that because we love eating salad and we love lunch and we love, you know, like the type of times a day that you would eat a salad and want a glass of wine. But how do you do that? You know, so. Well, and I appreciate the fact that you guys, you got a little nerdy, but you didn't go hardcore nerd yeah. on this. It's definitely an educational book and you can learn a lot. And Dana did a fabulous job writing about the wines and like really about like the, the origin of the wines, the place that it's from and um, kind of not like really geeky wine tasting notes, like right. being like, you know, a big wine magazine. Yeah. It's more like a general flavor profile and weight and body and, you know, like just the feel of the wine and how it works with the food really. Well, I appreciate that because I can get nerdy, but then when we start talking yeah. about all the things that you're getting from the glass and I'm just like, snooze alert, like, oh, yeah. let's just keep yeah. drinking guys. Really? I just feel like it's unnecessary. Like it's, especially, you know, we're talking about eating it with food. It's not like we're going to be sitting here, like picking out every little right. possible out of the glass. It's like, how does it work in your palate? Like how, why does it taste good together? You know, it doesn't have to be, um, so, um, cerebral, <laughs> you know, like yeah. you don't have to overthink, just, uh, you know, match the, match the weight of the wine and, you know, the weight of the food. And that's pretty much, you're good to go. No, I like it. Um, it's so funny when I got this cookbook, I was looking through it and the, the pictures in here are stunning. They're beautiful. Thank you. Is that you? Um, food styling. Yes. And then we worked with Ava Kalenko on, she's the photographer um she is amazing she was wonderful she came we did all the, the photo shoot in my house um over the course of six days and then we did a couple we did like a backyard dinner party at dana's house mm-hmm. and yeah we cooked dana was like the prep cook in the kitchen and then i was the one working you know under the camera and we were cooking together and then yeah. i would style it and so yeah it was it was really fun and intense week of <laughs> cooking <laughs> some recipes, you know. No, I bet. Well, the pictures are beautiful. But speaking of the pictures, I was flipping through and I'm like, oh, that lady looks familiar. And it's like, oh, that's Jen Quist. I had her on my podcast. So I I sent her a message on Instagram and I'm like, is that, are you in this cookbook? And she was like, oh yes, I'm friends with them. I was in, you know, I got invited or whatever. And I was in the, like in the photos. Yeah. So we had dinner parties, you know, to, especially for, I mean, we had dinner parties the whole time we were testing the recipes sure. we'd have like monthly dinner parties where we'd invite people over to taste the wines and the food and you know give us feedback and then for the photo shoot you know we did it again and invited friends in the yeah. community so it's just one of them i want to be in that circle <laughs> yeah, yeah like i don't do it nearly as much i mean since the pandemic and then i had a baby two years ago so mm-hmm. like i don't do this this i still like kind of live vicariously through those times a little bit because sure. i miss i miss the days where we'd have like 10 to 12 people over for dinner and cook <laughs> big meals um, sit around drinking opening too much wine <laughs> mm, yes yes honey yes i'm in um what are the challenges in starting a cookbook maybe the mid process of a cookbook because i feel like I don't want to say the market is saturated, but I mean, there's cookbooks on everything. So what are the challenges when you're starting this project? Um, Challenges, Um, lots of challenges, you know, like think, well, coming up with an idea, you know, having your idea and making sure that hasn't been done before. And how can you do it in a different way? (laughs) Because at this point, you're right. Like, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, like there's just a saturation of cookbooks, it seems like, but they're still selling and they're still wanting more and publishers are still, you know, like pumping them out yeah. and people, there's a need for it still. Um, and, you know, people are thinking about books and I think about this too, when I'm writing recipes or writing, you know, coming up with cookbook, cookbook ideas, people want books more as like entertainment cookbooks, you know, as like something that leisurely read on your sofa on a Sunday afternoon. It's not necessarily like utilitarian always. Um, especially like the type of books that, I think the most beautiful books are often just like, I just want to have that because the photography is gorgeous and it's inspiring. You know, like maybe I'm not going to cook verbatim a recipe out of it, but I'm going to be inspired to cook something from it, you know? Um, So um, that's kind of one thing about cookbooks. Um, But yeah, the challenges are, you know, just having the idea and like 
getting motivated for me. It's like getting motivated. I've had this idea actually for like 10 years to write this big, it's a big project, which would require a lot of research, a lot of world travel. And, um, I know it's a good idea and I just finding the motivation to, and like the, I don't know, it's like wrapping my head around the concept is kind of stifling a little bit. And I'm kind of struggling with that, but I'm, I'm feeling good about it. Like coming out of the pandemic and out of, you know, having the baby time and now I have a toddler and I'm like, okay, I think I'm ready to dive deeper into my book writing career and kind of do something much more serious and, um, um, you know, more of a reference book kind of thing, I guess you could say. So yeah, it's like, self-reliance and self-motivation is a big part of it. And then, you know, just getting people to believe in it, writing the proposal and having a compelling argument for why this book needs to be written and why the story needs to be told. The cell. So that's, yeah, the big cell. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I've been um, lucky. I've never actually had, I've never pitched a book yet that hasn't sold. So I'm like, I, that's also kind of like circling my brain. I'm like, oh my gosh, my, you know, like I can't mess up my streak of, you know, having good ideas. <laughs> like, what if this is the first bad? <laughs> you know, it's like there's always these the self doubt and this questioning of if it's a good idea or not. But sure. So, in all the things that you do now, because you're you're pulled into other projects, right? Someone has an idea and they're like, "Hey, let's reach out to Andrea," or someone's like, "Hey, you should call her because she can help you get this off the ground." Um, Great segue into my current project that I've been working on for too long actually because of the pandemic and the pregnancy and stuff like that. Um, I've been working on a book with a chef in Atlanta. His name is Steven Satterfield. Um, he has a restaurant called Miller union and it's, um, pretty much always voted the best restaurant in Atlanta and he's James Beard award winning chef and just a f- all around amazing person and wonderful, um, human being on top of being a incredible cook and, um, running a great restaurant. And he and I started working on a book project of his own, of his own. I'm his co-author. So it's his ideas. I'm kind of helping him formulate them and hone in. And, um, you know, some things I've come up with, but it's mostly his, his brain behind the and creativity behind the recipes. Um, and it's a book about vegetables called vegetable revelations, because that is his thing. He's the vegetable, um, I don't know, whisper, <laughs> I guess you can say he's, he's known. I think he was quoted in the New York, someone in the New York times when they were describing him, called him the vegetable shaman or something like that. I don't know. Nice. I don't know if I want to term, but um, <laughs> yeah, he's definitely known for his amazing ways with vegetables. And so this book that we started working on, actually the first time we talked about it was he hosted my book tour event in Atlanta for wine food. So Dana and I went to Atlanta, had this, amazing, it was our best book event of the whole tour. We did this really blown out, huge tour that you couldn't do nowadays because of COVID, but <laughs> um, we went to like 20 cities or something. And um, that was the best event of the whole tour is we sold like hundreds of books. It was incredible. He did like stations of the food and he cooked our recipes and was really true to the recipes. You know, most chefs that would host events would like kind of be inspired by the recipes, but just do their own thing. Right. And he they truly cooked the recipes for the book, which was so such an honor because, you know, he's, he's such a great chef himself. And, and he, after the event, we all went to dinner at his restaurant and, um, you know, drank a lot of wine. And he was like, I want to do a book and I would love to work with you on it. I really love the recipes. I love, you know, the way you wrote them and whatever. So that actually, that book transitioned into my next project. And, you know, it's been four years now that we've been working on it because of all the, you know, the chaos of running a restaurant during the pandemic, especially in the early days where sure. he had to like transition and figure out how to save the restaurant. And he was really proactive and um, um, a big player in the national restaurant movement to help save restaurants. And so he really had to transition. You know, we took a big, like almost a year of time off of writing the book because of um, that. And then I got pregnant. <laughs> so I had to take some time. So it was a long project. It was a four year project. And wow. most of my, most of my books have been like one year. So, um, but it's coming out in April and it's, you know, it's, we're it's put to bed. It's at the publishers and we're feeling really Yay. excited. He almost going to be here, but it was a, it was a big project that we, you know, I, he would, it was a lot, it was all over zoom. It was a different experience for me because all of my other projects had been in person with local people in Portland and, um, or Oregon. And this was all over FaceTime chats and email and Google documents. And he would, you know, we'd have these long conversations on a Sunday afternoon and kind of plot 
the recipe ideas and kind of hone in on what it was going to be for the, you know, the chapter that we were working on or whatever. And then, you know, he would jot down his ideas and send them to me and I would test the recipe and kind of formulate it and put it, put it into standard recipe writing right. terms. And um, yeah, it was a back and lots of back and forth and it, it was a great project. He was absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, you know, you kind of going into it, it was the first time I'd worked with a chef on a book and you kind of have a little bit of hesitation because, you know, there's kind of a reputation that chefs have big egos sometimes. And I've heard, you know, stories from other people that have worked with chefs on books and it not being the same experience, I had, but I was so lucky to have had the opportunity to work with him. I learned a lot from him and he was just the most gracious and wonderful person. So, well, and veggies are, become- <laughs> so, what's that? Yeah. Sorry. He's just become a really dear friend and somebody I, you know, will be close to my whole life. I think, you know, it's like writing a book with somebody is such a crazy, intimate thing. Like you're being really, you know, being two creative minds coming together and working on something so intently and um, with a deadline, it's like you really either bond or you don't bond. <laughs> Well, I've been very lucky that I bonded with my last few. I was going to um, say, when you when you mentioned that you wrote um, a cookbook with some girlfriends, I was like, oh, was that like a good idea yeah. or a bad idea? It, were, it definitely, yeah, there were definitely some moments. We had our moments for sure. It wasn't all, um, you know, picnic baskets and, you know, flowers and <laughs> wine drinking. There was, there was a lot of, yeah. um, especially with three, I think three was hard. I learned a lesson from that project that I, I wouldn't do it with three again. It's too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, no pun intended. It was like, a lot of, <laughs> um, you know, and we all had different, sure. our different backgrounds coming together and bringing, you know, um, but yeah, it, we're still friends. We actually just went out and had cocktails together a few weeks ago, but Perfect. Yeah, it's it's a um it can be straining on a relationship or it can be bonding. And I've, you know, developed some of my my most sacred relationships from this process. So well I'm really lucky. You went on a mission together, right? Like you went you went deep somewhere together. And so yeah, it's either gonna be you're gonna come out like never again or you're gonna come out high fiving like with a yeah. new friend. Yeah. And I've definitely had both experiences. <laughs> so <laughs> for sure. But um yeah, for the most part, I've been really lucky that I have partnered with people that are just really great and really easy to get along with and collaborative and, you know, able to compromise on things. Sure. That's an important part of it, you know, like compromising on your ideas and seeing the other person's point of view or, or being valuing the other person's opinions, I guess, you know, so, mm-hmm. yeah. I have to often, when I have people over cooking in my kitchen, I mean, I have to go to a happy place because I'm a little bit of a control freak. So like even loading the dishwasher, people, I'm like, oh, that's not right. And then they leave and I have to like redo the dishwasher. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I'm like that with my, uh, my parents and in-laws. <laughs> they get my, my mom comes over and, you know, staying with me and she's like, I'm like, oh my God. And you just like, yeah. take a deep breath. I'm like that too. When, when your kitchen is like your office, you know, it's like, you're really particular about things going to a certain place and things are done a certain way, but I'm definitely not as fussy as some people. <laughs> I've, I've worked with some people that are extremely yeah. uh, OCD about, you know, everything. And so like where things go, but yeah. I'm a little more really My mom yells it. at me often. She's like, you need to calm down. And I'm like, you need to dry off the silverware before you put it back in the drawer. Like, right? Like just, just obey obey my rules in the kitchen. I've obeyed your rules like growing up. I think my husband and I have that a little bit. (laughs) It sounds like something very familiar with like, you're not doing much more particular about him doing it than other people. Because I'm like, this is every day of our lives. You know, this is not just one time somebody putting our dishes away. This is like every day we have to be on the same page. Every day. (laughs) Um, Well, it's interesting. The cookbook, the project you just finished is all about vegetables because I read that's kind of your thing, right? Veggies and a little too much cheese is how you love to cook. Yeah, I do. Those are probably my things I love to cook the most. I just find that, well, cheese, I just love, it's my favorite food. I love cheese. It's like, I sometimes wish I would have gone into being more of a cheese expert than any, you know, which I guess I still could, but there's a lot of people out there that are cheese experts, but um vegetables I find to be the most inspiring and interesting thing to cook. You know, it's like a piece of meat, you know, there's a few, a handful of ways you can cook it for it to be delicious. You know, like either it's a steak that you want to cook like medium rare or, you know, a 
brisket that needs to be slow cooked and braised to be tender and pull apart. But with vegetables, it's like the textures and flavors that you can get out of them are infinite. It's like, there are so many things you can do with, you know, like zucchini, for instance, what a sponge for flavor and texture. And, you know, you can make it crispy. You can make it soft and tender. You can puree it. You can, you know, can serve it raw. You can serve it hot and grilled or whatever, you know, and it's just like fascinating. The create the options for what you can do with it are endless. So I find that really inspiring. And then being in a city like Portland, you know, we already kind of talked on this a little bit, but you have access to so much more than maybe let's say you would have in Nebraska, (laughs) right? Like, no. And I actually, that's a good point that you just brought up. I draw from my experience growing up in Nebraska a lot when I'm writing recipes in Portland, because I have access to everything, you know, like beautiful peak season fruit and, you know, especially in like September, October, the world is my, you know, at my fingertips, the world of food. Like I have the fall produce, I have the summer stuff, I have the tomatoes, the watermelon, everything, everything except for citrus, but you know, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th- and I think about like this dish, you know, the simplicity, I often just want to do something extremely simple and just let the flavor of the produce speak in that peak season. But then I'm like, people in Nebraska are not going to be able to have this incredible you know, stra- like a strawberry or whatever it is that, right. you know, there are amazing things in Nebraska. I don't want to say that amazing tomatoes, wonderful corn, yeah, always beef, you know, Nebraska has wonderful things, but in certain parts, I'm just using this as an example, in certain parts of the country, you don't have opportunities to taste this like perfect peach or right. pear, or whatever it is, you know? So yeah, it definitely influences writing recipes. And then again, like what you were saying with the more um, esoteric ingredients or more specialized ingredients. I definitely think like you can't get a lot of that in my hometown. So, um, and I don't think I've been as good about this in my previous books as I want to moving forward. And as I have been in my more recent books, I want to be less dogmatic about ingredients and give more options. So, you know, like if I call for, you know, like a certain type of honey or whatever, like, what's the alternative to that? You know, like, can they just, you know, whatever wildflower honey, you know, whatever they're, they ha- might have access to or whatever they might have in their cupboard. And I don't want people to have to go spend like a hundred dollars on condiments to make one recipe, you know? So giving, um, giving alternatives that will make an also a delicious dish, maybe it will be the identical dish of what I'm proposing in the recipe, but it will be something delicious and inspired by. Um, I think that is kind of, a way that I want to continue writing recipes right? and, you know, strive to make it accessible and realistic and, um, you know, efficient for people, I guess. Well, no, it's a true story. Uh I mean, access to certain things. I remember telling family members in South Carolina, like, Hey, I made this dish with burrata and just go look at your grocery store. And they're like, we don't have burrata in the grocery store. And I was like, Oh, that sucks. (laughs) I don't know what to tell you. Where were they? So they didn't have it in South Carolina. So like a small oh, town in South like, Carolina. It's small town. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, but maybe they can get fresh mozzarella. I exactly. So I said, just substitute that. But I think it is a real thing. You know, there are legit food deserts in this country where people don't have access to even farmer's markets, right? They just have like the grocery store down the street and they can't get all of these things that maybe you and I have access yeah. to. Yeah. Like things like even like produce that I think of as every day now, like mm-hmm. fennel rapini things like that like yeah you can't find that in the grocery store where so um and then there it also just kind of becomes like you kind of have to draw a line like maybe not every recipe can appeal to every single person or be possible for everybody you know like i do want to do recipes with like dungeness crab sometimes which is a specialty of oregon and like maybe it's just not a recipe for you but it's you know it'll find its person you know it's people that want to cook that you know Mm -hmm. so yeah it's kind of like the you have to draw a line somewhere of like, it can't be, you can't be thinking about like absolutely everywhere in the world. Can they get this ingredient? You know? So I don't know. It's, it's, it's a hard decision to make a lot of the time. Like, okay, is this, is this ingredient too weird for people? I don't know. But I think it's also being realistic, right? Like in just perspective, putting yourself in in kind of other people's mindsets and shoes, like what do they have access to and, and how can we make how, really just give them the inspiration to make something incredible and delicious on their own. Yes. Yes, exactly. Inspiring them to just think 
think, you know, give them a little inspiration from the recipe, even if it's not going to be verbatim what I wrote, right. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to wrap up a little bit. Um, I do want to touch on, we talked about it a little bit, all the beautiful things behind you. Are these the things that end up in your cookbooks? Yeah. Cookbooks and food styling work and just dinner parties, everyday dinners. I don't know. I just pull from this shelf of things for, you know, I just like having beautiful things to serve. Like I go to like my parent, my mom's house and she's like, Oh, don't use that. That's only for, you know, special occasions. I don't believe in that. I'm like every night I want it to be a beautiful presentation yeah. of my dinner. It just makes me, it feels fun. Like why, why have something if you're just going to like shove it in a cupboard and never use it, you know? Agreed. So I like, I like, um, I'm very visually, um, I don't know, focused and want to, present things in an aesthetically pleasing way. I agree. <laughs> so that's that into my food styling career. So yeah, we didn't really even touch on that, but yeah, food styling is kind of at least half of my career now. So yeah, I do a lot of um, work with different companies um, nationwide, um, food companies and creating um, recipes, but all, and then styling them and working with photographers on, um, you know, just making the food look beautiful for the camera. Well, food styling is definitely, I've interviewed a couple and it's huge, right? They're the, I mean, we, we eat with our eyeballs, but even in a cookbook or a magazine, I mean, that's the reason why I go for this cookbook and not this one because of the dish on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. It's very true. I think that I'm, I'm definitely, like I just said, I'm definitely drawn to the the visuals. So it's super important to me. And that's kind of, I got into food styling through writing cookbooks and just kind of being thrown in. I styled my egg book. That was my first project in food styling. And then just kind of from there, I started working with local photographers and developing my skills with food styling and, you know, reading about it. And there was this really wonderful um, kind of um, iconic food, um, food stylist who lived in Portland. She moved to Portland from New York city. Um, and she wrote this book called food styling. Like it's the tome on food styling. It's like yeah. this thick, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the book and it has all the tips and tricks. And I took a few classes from her and she kind of, um, was also inspiring to me. And anyway, I now have my career is kind of cookbook writing and food styling. Those are the, really the two major aspects of it. And then I do writing for food and wine, Mm-hmm. as well um on occasion so yeah it's do you feel like those those two things are your things because that's where your strengths are with with all the things that yeah. you're very good at like those are the two that you just like really that's what lights your fire yeah those are the two things that I'm most interested in and I think just kind of naturally came to me like naturally I developed a um talent or skill in it and that's just where I've yeah, I just feel most proud of those things. So yeah, it's kind of where my interests lie now. <laughs> too, yeah. so. Um, I interviewed Christine Tobin. She works for Milk Street. Uh, she's a food mm-hmm. stylist. And one of my big questions for her was especially she cooks all the things that she styles. It's very important for her to have that control with the food. And then really she's like, there's no, we don't cut corners as far as like adding fake things to make the food look beautiful. It's just, it's just the food. Here it is. Take a picture. Yeah. Um, different companies that I work with have different needs in terms of that, but yeah, for the most part, everything I cook is real. I don't like use like fake ice cream or whatever. It's always real ice cream. I do have like tricks that I do and things that I apply to the ice cream to maybe make it look, um, you know, like, just more appealing and like to freeze it, basically freeze it for the camera, you know, like make it look appealing to the camera because the camera sees things differently than how we see it Mm -hmm. and, um, setting up a scene, you know, like maybe the, there's time that goes into that and the food won't look as good by the time we get the scene set. So there's like, there's things that are done to the food, but it's not, it is the actual ice cream. Yeah. So food's your model. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. These are your, yeah, exactly. your models. The um, model and your the makeup. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in the clothing. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure, I mean, there's some foods like vegetables that are probably like the perfect model because it's just like, just sit yeah. there and do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. Spray them with a little bit of something to get them like all glisteny looking and then they're good to go. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, now we are going to wrap up and get to the final three, but look for 
the the new book, the cookbook that you helped with, right? That's coming out in April. Revelations. Yep, I co-authored the book. Stephen Satterfield is the um the other author. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, final three. Best advice you've ever been given. Um, I have to go back to when we were talking earlier about starting out in my career. Um, like it is cliche as it sounds, like think big, think bigger than what you even can imagine and continue to, um, believe in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Like I still to this day, I'm like, have to tell myself you can do this. You know, like it's believe if you believe in yourself, you know, like you can manifest the, you know, the, the outcome that you want. So I truly believe in that. And I constantly have to tell myself that still. So that's my, that's my biggest advice. Okay, good. That's good advice. Uh, what's your happy place? Um, the beach, <laughs> the beach with really delicious, like fresh seafood Yes. and a glass of cold wine, <laughs> cold white wine. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's a, I'll put that on my list of happy places too. Um, and then in all things, food and drink, what do you crave? What always sounds good to you? Pasta. Definitely. Pasta, cheesy pasta. <laughs> Carbonara, something like that. I love Roman style pastas, especially. Yeah. Pepe. Things that are simple and perfectly al dente noodles and cheese in them and fatty. Yeah. So like rich food. You're speaking my language. You're speaking my language. <laughs> and then, and then beverage. Um, wine. Okay. Probably my go-to would be Gamay or a good aged Riesling. Nice. Probably be, yeah. I don't think Cause they pair, both of those wines pair with almost every food you could eat. So I think that's why I thought of that. Okay. <laughs> no, that's a good call. That's a good call. Um, thank you so much for chatting with me and sharing your story and all of the, the challenges and successes you've had. Um, I love the fact that you, you moved to Portland, you had 8,000 jobs, and then now you've like whittled them down to the things that you're truly passionate about. So it's just a, it's a really beautiful success story you've had. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's really great to hear. Um, and tell us the name of the book again, coming out in April. Vegetable Revelations. Okay. And that's, we can, people can find that wherever books are sold. Um, it's Everywhere books are sold, it's in all the major booksellers, you know, Amazon, the Barnes and Noble, it's already available for pre-sale. So you can go check it out right now. Okay. Yep. I'm also just going to suggest if people are into wine and food and food and wine together, uh, wine food is not only incredibly beautiful to look at, it's one of those entertainment cookbooks that I sit down mm -hmm. on the couch on a Sunday afternoon and just look at, but so much fun inspiration as far as, you know, even pairing things together in this book. So love it. Um, Andrea Sloniker, I want to make sure I say that right. Uh, thank you again so much for being here all the way from Portland, my, my neighbor up north. So thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. Thank you. It was great talking to you. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma with me, Trish Glows. Today's episode sponsored by The Culinarium, Gourmet Provisions, and Fine Kitchen Wear. You can watch this podcast and subscribe on my YouTube channel. Just search Hungry for More. You can also listen and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts.